Hello, Dr. Glenn, resident vet for Vet and Pet Direct, talking today about crazy old dogs. I've got one, my 13-year-old Dalmatian, Epony Ray, shout out to Kath and Kim fans, is a crazy old dog. She has been crazy for about three years now, but is it dementia or is it just old age? Do dogs get Alzheimer's? They certainly do. Let's have a talk about that. Let's answer some common questions about crazy old dogs. Do old dogs get dementia? They absolutely do. It's similar to Alzheimer's in people, called canine cognitive dysfunction. Definitely their brain can change to the negative and it goes undiagnosed or underdiagnosed often early um, in the course of the disease. It's a progressive disease, unfortunately, for which there's no cure, but early intervention can certainly slow down the course of the disease and that is the most important time for crazy old dogs. Is canine dementia like Alzheimer's? In lots of ways that it is, dogs certainly get beta amyloid plaques, which is a similar pathogenic process to Alzheimer's. They also get um, bundles of nerves that don't communicate as well with each other. It's also similar another way in that we don't really understand everything that's going on, like Alzheimer's in people. And also early intervention is the best way to hopefully see some response because later in the disease, same as with people, unfortunately there's not a lot we can do. What are the symptoms of canine cognitive dysfunction? Basically they can be grouped around seven different general symptoms that go by the acronym DISHA, D-I-S-H, triple A. That stands for D for disorientation, where they appear lost and confused. I for interactions with people and other pets that have changed. S for sleep and wake alterations where they sleep more during the day and have more trouble sleeping at night. H for house soiling where both their toilet habits change from what they used to be. A for activity level alterations where they become more sedative and passive or they run around and just act different. A for appetite changes and A for anxiety. Disorientation, feeling lost and confused. That can really be difficult sometimes with old dogs when you've got vision problems, hearing problems and arthritis and mobility issues, but really they just become less aware of their surroundings or they change their interaction with surroundings. My old dog, she gets in the corner of the room and doesn't know how to get out of the room. She'll get stuck behind the table or behind chairs. Sometimes they'll just be wandering around and appearing not to know where they are, even though their vision means that they can actually see. Sometimes they'll change interactions with people and seem to be less aware of people that they normally know, even though they can see them. Just lots of different behavioral changes where they just act differently to what you'd expect them to do in the same situation. Interactions with other pets and people can change. Sometimes that means that they become more aggressive to people or animals that they don't normally get aggressive to. Sometimes they withdraw and don't seem to be as excited or happy to see people and they don't interact in a normal way. Sometimes they can just be quite withdrawn and seek out active interaction with people and animals as much as they used to. Sleep, wake alterations are really common. A lot of these pets will sleep more during the day but seem to have trouble sleeping at night. It can be really disruptive to the household, disruptive to the people's sleep, to other pets sleep. If the pet's sleeping all day and then when everyone else wants to go to bed, the pet's wide awake, wired, trotting around the house, running into things, again getting stuck in corners and doing unusual behaviours can be frustrating but there's no point taking it on the pet because that's just going to make them even more anxious and frustrated about their own situation. But it can be really difficult in the household. House soiling, uh, changes in their toilet behaviour. Um, some pets will become urinary incontinent, some pets will become faecally incontinent, either when they're awake or asleep. That might mean there's just a poo in the bed that never used to be there. Sometimes that means that they're just walking around the house and they can't ask to be let outside like they used to be able to do. Or sometimes they just sort of get caught short and all of a sudden you turn around and they're just starting to have a poo inside. And that's a really common behavior. Again, they're not wanting to do that. They're not trying to do that. It's just happening and they don't probably understand why, but it's a really common problem.
activity level alterations that can mean both directions. Sometimes they'll become more active in times when you think that they should be less active. When everyone else is relaxing, when they'd normally be resting or sleeping, they're running around the house, running around outside, doing like compulsive behaviours that are hard to distract them from, where they're becoming less aware of their surroundings. Sometimes it's barking more in situations when there's nothing to bark at. And again, that's difficult to ascertain because sometimes they've got hearing problems and are they thinking they're hearing something or they're not getting the normal response from the dog next door when they bark at it. Or alternatively, when there's more commotion going on and more interaction going on, they're just withdrawn and quiet. They're just not behaving normally. Appetite changes, again, that can be both increased appetite. My crazy old Dally, she's really, really food obsessed now. You just can't get her to settle anytime there's any food on offer and she's far more hungry than she used to be. Some pets are the opposite and you'll have reduced appetite and reduced weight because of it because you just can't stimulate their appetite even though they've got no metabolic health problems. You've done all the blood tests, they're healthy, um, but they've just got reduced appetite. So again, it's part of their brain dysfunction. Anxiety, anxiety is a big part of canine cognitive dysfunction. And again, it's complicated. I see pets with arthritis, they've got higher pain levels in their life and that can make them more anxious with interacting with other pets in the household, interacting with people in the household. Anxiety can stack over a pet's lifetime and they'll become more noise anxious, they'll become more separation anxiety, they'll become more situation anxiety sensitive. But anxiety levels certainly seem to increase as part of this cognitive dysfunction. And I mean, getting into their brain it can't be much fun if your brain isn't working properly you don't have as good understanding of your environment and the interactions you're having with your environment must be frustrating and can only build to anxiety levels. How do I know if my dog's got canine cognitive dysfunction? You've really got to get your vet involved because although there's a long list of symptoms that your dog could be displaying that are definitely very suggestive of canine cognitive dysfunction it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. There's lots of health issues that old dogs get that can contribute to make that look like this problem when it's actually other health issues. An old dog with cataracts that's half deaf, that's got liver disease causing hepatic encephalopathy has got a specific condition that's not CCD. And the only way you can diagnose that is to do blood tests and ultrasounds and diagnose liver disease as opposed to canine cognitive dysfunction. So it's definitely blood tests, a thorough physical exam. You can diagnose it sometimes on an MRI, not that that many pets end up going to MRIs, but you know things like brain tumours and other health diseases that have potentially got different treatment options need to be ruled out before you get to um, a diagnosis of CCD. Once you've got there, there's definitely some options that we can put in place that can help out. But if you miss a diagnosis of something else that's maybe easily treatable, preventable, that's really important. Rather than just saying, okay, there's a checklist and there's lots of checklists that you can download and we'll put that in the show notes that go through, okay, these are my dog's behaviors. This is the symptoms I'm seeing. And you can take that to your vet and say, hey, I've got a suspicion that my dog's got this. Can we check it out, rule out the other things and then get a plan in place to help out. Can we cure canine cognitive dysfunction? Unfortunately, at this stage we can't. There are lots of interventions through lifestyle change, dietary changes, prescription medications, both registered for that use and off-label use, human medications that can help. University of Sydney has done a couple of surgeries on dogs that have shown early promising signs, but basically it's not a curable disease. The earlier we intervene when you start to see the subtle symptoms, rule out the other disease processes that can potentially contribute, the better the outcome is and the more potentially we can slow the progression of the disease down so your dog lives a happier, longer life. What can I do to help my dog with canine cognitive dysfunction? Uh, once you've got to a diagnosis with your vet, there are certainly prescription medications that can help or at least we think can help with the 
progression of the disease. There's a medication called Vivitonin that's a prescription drug in Australia that can increase the blood supply to certain parts of the brain that seems to help to slow down the course of the disease. There are off-label use of human Alzheimer's drugs that some vets will prescribe. There are certainly anti-anxiety medications that you can use and anti-anxiety supplements and things you can do to help with the anxiety symptoms. There are things like prescription melatonin which can help with wake sleep cycles that potentially can have your pet maybe more aware and awake during the day and potentially sleep better during the night um, when everyone wants to get to sleep. So certainly prescription medications, there's lots of options there that can help. Dietary changes that can help. There are certainly some evidence that omega-3 oils having an anti-inflammatory effect, medium chain triglycerides as an alternative energy source for brain cells can potentially help high antioxidant levels in the diet, might be able to um, stabilise brain chemistry, try to slow down these beta amyloid plaques building up. There's a few prescription veterinary diets that are made that are potentially beneficial in the prevention of canine cognitive dysfunction. Increasingly, a lot of vets are going down the path of recommending a balanced meat-based diet, so a more natural-based diet for pets with the addition of like 10% of colourful fruit and vegetables that are high in antioxidants, things like um, raspberries and blueberries and carrots and spinaches and kales that can have potentially an antioxidant effect in the diet. There is potentially an increasing body of evidence to suggest that some of the byproducts of high temperature kibble extrusion, so when manufactured diets are given high temperature treatment to make kibbles, um, is some of the acrylamides and benzene based toxins that are in there, is that having a long term negative effect on brain function in dogs. Lots of vets have gone down the path of not recommending kibble based diets and and having a more natural based diet. There's lots of supplements that you can potentially add to those diets or add to any diet that could help. Some vets are going down the path of measuring vitamin D status of dogs because both low vitamin D status and excessive vitamin D in diets can have a negative effect on both immune function and brain function. Potentially vitamin E supplements and vitamin C supplements are unlikely to do harm, and potentially can help with an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect. A good whack of omega-3 oil in the diet, as in 1,000 milligrams per 10 kilo of body weight to have an anti-inflammatory effect could be important. The brain is about 60% fatty acids essentially, so having a good amount of essential fatty acids in the diet makes sense. A medium chain triglyceride supplement, MCT oil, modified coconut oil, potentially can be used as an alternative energy source for brain cells. Brain cells traditionally have been thought to run mostly on glucose, but medium chain triglycerides have been shown in the presence of ketones to be able to actually feed brain cells as well, so it's not gonna do any harm. Multivitamin, multi-mineral supplements like Vets All Natural Health Booster um, can potentially give um, a lot of those vitamins and minerals that are helpful for brain function. Turmeric has probably got its place with um, and its anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect as well. Canine enrichment can certainly help. Anything that keeps your dog's brain active when they've got potentially less physical capabilities, things that can keep them mentally stimulated, um, rewiring brain pathways, all those things can potentially be of benefit. So using food as enrichment, making them um, work a little bit harder, toy, based food rewards, that sort of thing can definitely help. The sense of smell doesn't seem to go away, so nose work, having reward, again, food for sniffing out different things and doing some nose work can definitely help. Physical stimulation is definitely important to keep brain function and blood flow going, so with whatever capability your pet has for exercise, definitely doing that is a great idea. So just trying to make their lives as healthy and as rich as possible. When's it time? When do you have the discussion about is euthanasia the right path um, for the pet or for the family? Um, it's a very difficult discussion to have. Probably needs to be had within the family group and also with your vet there in. Um, at some stage, like cognitive dysfunction, it's not a fatal disease. Having trouble with this one. Um, 
it's just a really important discussion to have within the family and with your vet because sometimes it comes to where for the family's health and the dog's health um, that becomes the right decision. I hope that helps with the answers to some questions on a really difficult topic. Basically, check in with your vet, check in with your family, um, check in with your dog. Hopefully we can keep our pets' lives as happy and as healthy as possible and make their lives great.